Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dr. Carolyn Coker Ross podcast. Today I have with me Matt Pappas, and we're going to be talking about the link between childhood trauma and eating disorders. Hi, Matt. Hey, Carolyn. How are you? Thanks for having me on your podcast. You're very welcome. So can you tell my listeners a little bit about yourself and how you you got it, uh, started doing what you're doing now. Sure, yeah. I am a, a certified coach and um, NLP practitioner. I work with clients uh, one-on-one and in groups, uh, mostly online, virtually through you know things like Zoom, and uh, primarily working with those who are trauma survivors and those who are looking to overcome uh, severe anxiety in their lives. So uh, we do uh, coaching every single night. Uh, with a colleague of mine. We do obviously the podcast, which I'm in. Um, I blog. I'm a, I'm a big advocate for survivors and those who, who live with severe anxiety because of course I know what it's like to live with those things, being a survivor myself and mm-hmm. dealing with anxiety for quite, you know, such a long time. So it's, uh, I love what I'm able to do. Um, I feel wonderful. like, yeah, I feel like now at about 46, I finally found my calling in life. So because <laughs> <laughs> you, you did a career change, didn't you? So yeah, were- I worked, I worked uh, as an engineer for about 17 years, and yeah. I just left that, that career in June of this year. Oh, so, my goodness. Yeah. yeah, so I'm a full-time advocate, podcaster, um, mm-hmm. you know, taking a chance and, and doing what I love and, um, mm-hmm. you know, realizing that the work that, that, that you do, the work that I do, that so many of us do is so important, and, um, you know, I enjoy it immensely. Was there a point in your life when you were an engineer where, where you had kind of an aha moment or something that made you say, wow, I, I really am not following my passion? Well, I mean, I started to kind of get the inkling a little bit when I, when I, when I began working with a coach. Um, you know, I had, I had been with a therapist for a couple of years and we had worked on all kinds of trauma. And so then I, I kind of trans, uh, transitioned into working with a coach to take my healing to the next level and, you know, get a different perspective and take where I am now and move forward. So it was kind of working through that experience of being, of working with a coach, began, you know, writing my blog and doing podcasts and thinking, you know, I kind of like doing this. And, you know, Mm -hmm. obviously there are millions of survivors all over the world, way more than millions who, you know, Mm -hmm. have experienced all type of trauma. So it was kind of an overtime thing that started to develop. And I realized that, you know, I'm just, I appreciate what my career as an engineer did for me for quite a while. It served a purpose, um, mm-hmm. you know, and it helped me in a great many ways. And now it's time to move on to the next phase of my life, which is working mm-hmm. with survivors, working with those who, who, who deal with anxiety and um, okay. just realizing that it was, it was time for a change. And I wanted to do something that really kind of made a difference in the world in somebody's life more yeah. so than an engineer. <laughs> And working with trauma, trauma survivors definitely can make a big difference in their lives. Mm-hmm. So were, were you aware all along that you had been a trauma survivor or did your memories come later in life? Well, that's kind of an interesting thing. And for anybody who's listened to the podcast or read the blogs, you know, I'll give you like the quick uh, synopsis is I was a victim of childhood trauma between five and 10 and then of, of severe bullying um, from late elementary all the way through middle school. So all growing up um, after I graduated, like I knew something had happened, but I didn't deal with it. I pushed it aside. I didn't care. It didn't affect me. I'm going to live my life. Mm-hmm. So I was aware, but I didn't deal with it. Yeah. I didn't really care. I'm like, this is so long ago. This doesn't bother me. I'll live my life. I'm fine. So I kind of proceeded down that path for the next three, three decades, you know, yeah. give or take up until my mid forties or so when I realized that, you know, I'm sorry, my early forties when I realized something was going on. So all through my teenage years, twenties, thirties, I'm like just doing my thing. And then when I got to working with a therapist, which wasn't even about trauma at first, it was because I was divorced and trying to figure out how to pick up the pieces of my life and why am I broken and why did she leave and what am I doing wrong and how do I fix myself and all this stuff. Right. So it started with that. And then it more, and then during a writing assignment and some, routine therapy sessions that I had written about being a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. And so then that kind of came out and then that's what really started it down the path of really going deep into the healing work that was trauma. So, yeah. um, Yeah. So I spent a good part of my life pretending it didn't exist. Well, um, can you, can you um, just expand on the 
notion of how trauma does affect a survivor's life? Like what kinds of things did you start to see in your life when you did start going to therapy? Maybe looking back, being able to see, oh, that's because, oh, yeah. um, because I, I, I think so many people who are trauma survivors are just like you. They think, oh, that happened so long ago. It's not, it doesn't have any effect on me. Mm-hmm. But, but, and sometimes the signs are very subtle. But what were the signs as you were looking back once you started to realize that there was a, a connection? What were the well, signs that you were seeing? There were a lot of things in my life that I was dealing with. Um, I mean, all throughout my life, I had self-esteem problems, you know, self-confidence, problems with my weight. Um, uh, learning disability in elementary and middle school. So I had to go to one of the special buses or trailers to learn mm-hmm. outside of regular class for some of my, some of my day. Um, all kinds of um, attachment issues and uh, mm-hmm. things of that nature that really kind of plagued me off and on my whole life. But I thought that's just what, who I was. Like I didn't, I didn't put any pu- pieces of the puzzle together that it was all coming from childhood trauma until I started working with a therapist and a coach and digging or, you know, kind of, kind of diving deep into it. But all of those things were, can and often do start as a result of being a survivor of trauma. So it was all of that stuff. And, and then some that really kind of, once you start to put the pieces together, you're like, wow, now I know why I feel like this and why, you know, now I know why I struggle with that. And, and then once you learn it and you understand it, then, then you can start to kind of put pieces in place to change it. But yeah, yeah I, I had all kinds of stuff going on. Well, can you talk a little bit more about, because as you know, I'm very interested in in trauma and its effect on our eating and um, body image issues and so on. So what were the things that you've learned either from working with your coach or your therapist or even working with the people who you have these groups with uh, about the connection between food and trauma? Well, I, I mean, and as you know, there are just so many areas. I mean, when I was when I was growing up, for pretty much most of my life up until about sixteen or so, fifteen, sixteen, um, I had problems with my weight. Like I had really bad acne. I had problems speaking. I had, um, you know, the way that the way that my parents dressed me when I was young was just a tragedy. It was horrible. So, <laughs> like all of these things were. We're, we're like the perfect storm of a way to be bullied and a way yeah. to, to kind of immerse myself in food because I'm like, well, if you're going to make fun of me and I can't seem to change it, I might as well just enjoy what I'm doing and be miserable, but be happy while I'm doing it. So mm-hmm. I had, you know, I mean, I was just, I, I had unhealthy eating habits. I was just, you know, I would binge on chips and pretzels and ice cream all the time. And, you know, I had been known to eat a whole pizza by myself and not even think twice about it. And so mm-hmm. all those types of things growing up, um, you know, we're just kind of, every time I got bullied, it was because of something usually regarding my weight or it was my complexion or my speech or my hair, or my learning disability or my clothes or whatever. So I pretty much just retreated to the fact that I'm just going to be kind of a recluse and isolate and just eat and, and kind of, and, and feel better. And of course, you know, as you know, the more you eat, you feel better for a time and then it right. kind of starts and then, and then the shaming kicks in. So I went through all of that for Oh my God, for just for up until middle of high school, when I kind of had a light bulb moment, which ended up kind of, I mean, in retrospect, it wasn't really a healthy light bulb moment, but it was for me where I'm like, I'm sick and tired of this. I'm not going to get bullied anymore. I'm going to change myself. So the summer before my junior year, I went on this crash diet where I ate almost nothing for like three straight months. You know, wow. I got out of school, I ate almost nothing. I was outside all day running, exercising. And by the time I, and so in three months, I dropped like 40 pounds. I, you know, so I went to school as a, in, as, as a junior with new clothes and a cool haircut. And I was like, you know what? I'm taking my life back. I don't care anymore. I'm just not going to eat. And that's how I'm going to lose weight. And I mean, mm-hmm. it, it worked because I lost all the weight. And now obviously that's not a healthy way to do it. But right. at 16, I didn't care, nor did I understand. I'm like, I've got to make a change. And, and the only thing I can do is stop eating. So I did. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I went to a dermatologist and all kinds of things. So basically, I kind of reinvented myself mm. the last two years of high school. And that's, uh, I, I wrote a post a while back called Taking Back My Life, where I'm just like, I'm not gonna let anything bother me. I don't care. I'm a new guy. And so, again, I had an unhealthy relationship with food because I wasn't eating it. So, yes, right. And so, you know, I mean. Well, how, I, long, how long did that last? Uh, well, I mean, 
once I literally, I kind of kept up that regimen for the most part up until I was about 21, 22. Oh my goodness. Wow. So I was pretty much not eating at all or eating very little or, um, you know, for years. And oh. then, and then it called up to me once I got married the first time and I kind of, I don't know, settled in or maybe, maybe just my body was like, okay, I've had enough. So then I started eating more and, and of course the weight came back on and then I had struggles with that again and all right. kinds of shame. And so then it was, it was a yo-yo thing up and down for well, decades, yes. of, you know, trying to find my rhythm, trying to find myself again, dealing with shame. My self-confidence was shot again. I got divorced. That all just went, you know, to hell in a handbasket. So I had self-esteem issues again and just all kinds of things that um, food. So, so you said though that the uh, extreme diet was a wake-up call for you. I understand taking back your life, mm -hmm. that desire to, you know, want to be more in control, that desire to really even step into who you really are because it sounds like you know with your parents stressing you and all of the problems you had and you know the other issues that you weren't feeling in control but how was that a light bulb moment for you to take well take your life back well I mean and, and I guess I say light bulb moment for lack of a better term because oftentimes when as 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 uh, survivors we have these light bulb moments which are which are usually good things Yes. And so for this, it was my light bulb moment or my, the only way that I could feel in control again was food was controlling me. So I'm like, well, I'm going to control you. I'm not going to eat. And that's just okay. the end of it. And you yeah. can't do anything about it because I'm not going to eat. So mm -hmm. it, it was a control thing in retrospect, although at the time I wasn't putting those pieces together, mm -hmm. but it was about understanding that food was running my life. Um, and I, and the only way that I could figure out being a somewhat, I don't know, naive teenager, for lack of a better term, is I'm just not going to eat. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, so again, it worked, but it, it, it wasn't a long-term solution. It wasn't addressing the problem. It was just yes. addressing the symptom. So, exactly. and, you know, oftentimes when we're young, we don't think about the long-term consequences. We don't think about the problems. We just like, okay, I need a quick fix. What is that? I'm not going to eat. And so that's yeah, why. And, and that's how eating, disor eating disorders often start. They mm -hmm. can start with a diet and people just, you know, they get all the positive feedback and suddenly it, everything looks better because they've lost weight and then they can't stay on the diet. But the diet often can trigger eating disorders, as you know. Yep. So, so in your role as a podcaster, I'm just wondering, as you're listening in these groups that you and uh, your colleague run, how has that contributed to your healing, your personal healing process? Well, the groups are incredible, and we actually do cover um, eating disorders and food issues um, on, a, on a regular basis. So, mm -hmm. And when you work with, with trauma survivors and people who also have struggles with food, you just one of, the, one of the biggest things I've learned is I am surely not alone. There are so many struggles with food and being a survivor. Um, you know, it doesn't automatically mean that you're going to have um, some type of uh, eating disorder or some type of struggle with food, but it's certainly not uncommon. So I've mm -hmm. learned, number one, that I'm not alone and that there are a lot of people who struggle with similar types of things, shaming around food, shaming about going to the grocery store and buying certain foods, trying to hide it in your shopping cart so nobody sees what you buy, like mm -hmm. all these different things, um, you know, just it's really so much about just how much we shame ourselves and how much we think people are judging us based yeah. on what we buy or what we you know or what we eat or what we they, they think we're eating or if we're in a restaurant and you know we order something that maybe isn't the most healthy thing then we're kind of like self-conscious and we're trying to scarf it down or take it home so nobody sees us eat it like all these things come up when we're having discussions in the groups and it's really just it's an amazing experience to see people share and everybody cheers each other on and and supports each other and really just kind of gets it you know when you're when you're among people who get what it means to struggle and then it makes celebrating the wins so much more amazing and it makes coming alongside somebody and just giving them you know um, a virtual hug or some encouragement or just some support when they need it is really uh it's really it's yeah. really kind of an amazing experience that's wonderful. So you feel it's contributed to you personally, besides just I'm not alone. It, it is hitting any other points in your life that maybe you didn't notice or weren't aware of. Um, I think. Well, yeah. I mean, it, the part of not being alone is is really a huge one. But it really just kind of when you listen to other people share their struggles, 
it causes you to, to kind of reflect within yourself and be like, wow, do I ever struggle with that? Well, I mean, maybe I have. And if I mm -hmm. have, how can I deal with this in a more healthy way? And you learn that sometimes when you listen to other people share, you're like, wow, I kind of struggle with that too. And I didn't really realize it. Yeah. And so it can be this thing of maybe I need to work on this or maybe I need to work, think this through or, mm -hmm. you know, so, cause I mean, I've had some moments where people have shared things like, I mean, like about the, the uh, shopping cart at the grocery store. I'm like, I never realized that I try and hide my bag of pretzels in the bottom of my, um, of my cart. And so things yes. like that, where I, I'm kind of like, it's all about shame and feeling like mm -hmm. I'm being judged. And of course, anxiety is all in there too. And yeah. so it is kind of this, wow, I need to work on that a little bit. Or I didn't realize that bothered me as much as it does. Maybe I need to, you know, talk to my therapist, yeah. talk to a coach, do some research, see if this is really something I need to dive into or not. So yeah, that's, that's what we call reflections, right? Where you get a reflection Absolutely. of something that, that you're experiencing through another person and it can be very healing. Let's talk, mm -hmm. a, talk a little bit more about shame. What is your understanding or experience about why shame is so connected to trauma and, and eating disorders? Well, I mean, when you are a victim of, of any kind of childhood trauma, you one, one of the biggest things you do is you shame yourself because of what you should have done or what you thought you should have done or what you didn't do or what the, or what the perpetrator has groomed you to think that you should have been done or been able to do. It's all about this, this kind of looking at yourself with this, with this should complex of why I didn't do this. Why didn't I run away? Why didn't I tell somebody? Why did I let him or her do that? Why did I go to their house? Why did I not see the signs? Why didn't I tell somebody? Why didn't I run away? And so it's all this, this, I should have done this. Why didn't I do that? Going back to the past, trying to relive what happened and figure out a way to change it when you can't. And right. then trying to rationalize why you didn't do it. And then you feel worse because you're rationalizing why you didn't do something. Yes, so exactly. This shame piled on, shame piled on, piled on. It's just this vicious cycle of yeah. yourself up about something that you, you know, if we're talking about trauma, it's like you couldn't control it. There's no, you know, so often we think, you know, I should have seen the signs. I, sh I should have done something. And especially when you're a child or if you're an adult in a circumstance where you can't get away, it's not your fault, but we think it is because yeah. our adult minds are trying to say, well, you're an adult. You should be able to take care of yourself. You should be able to run away. You should yeah. tell somebody. But of course there are a million and one circumstances why you can't or didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And until you make peace with that and understand it and radically accept what happened and then move forward, then you can start to kind of ease the shaming a bit. But until you do that, it's just mm -hmm. a cycle of shame after shame after shame. And then on top of that, if you develop an eating disorder or even disordered eating, that also leads to shame because you feel embarrassed about how mm -hmm. much you're eating and what you're binging on and why can't you control what you're eating, what's wrong with you, et cetera, et cetera, right? Oh my God, yeah. And, and I mean, and of course, social media, the television, uh, magazines, billboards, everything is all about the latest diet, get into the new clothes. I mean, you know, when you see commercials on TV, you see people who are models, people who are have, you know, this certain type of prototypical figure that you're supposed to have. And so you yeah. can't fit into that. Then you're like, well, man, I must be broken. I, there's, there's something wrong with me. I'm not as cool as they are. I'm not as important. I can't do this. So then mm -hmm. you're shaming yourself for why you can't fit into a certain size or why you enjoy certain foods that maybe aren't deemed healthy. And so it's, again, it's all about shaming and because you're bombarded with having to look a certain way or change yourself to feel better. Cause you know, if you, yeah. if you do, if you're on this diet, you're going to feel better and be more healthy. So you're going to have a better life. And I'm like, no, but <laughs> that's yeah. what we think. <laughs> but that's what we're supposed to do, think anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's more uh, media focus for men now on body types and looking a certain way? Do you think it's worse than it was when you were younger as a young boy? <sighs> I don't really know that it's, I mean, I guess in some ways it is, but I mean, there, there is, there is progress being made. I mean, there are, um, you know, social interest groups and there are some companies who are promoting those who aren't some model type size or look yeah. and the commercials and advertising. So there is some hope there that they're branching out, you know, to those who don't fit into some type of stereotypical way that you're supposed to look, but in, in other ways too, though, with, with, with social media, and, you know, the latest workout fads and diets that, that are never going to go away. And there's always some new exercise video or some new thing that you're supposed to eat or not eat because it causes some disease. And so, yes, um, I would say in some ways we are making progress, but, you know, 
in some ways, no, because there's still just this, for all the progress there is, there's still just this way of you have to weigh a certain amount and wear a certain type of clothes and eat a certain type of foods. Otherwise, you're not going to be healthy. You're endangering your life. You're doing all these horrible things to yourself. And yeah, so, yeah. yeah there's a lot of pressure to conform in society. Uh-huh. And I just, I, I've seen an increase in media focus on males. You know, it's always been there for women, mm-hmm. but it seems like more and more magazines for men, men's journals are focused on, you know, how to get the six pack, how to, you know, get bulk up or slim down or mm-hmm. et cetera. I mean, if on any given day, if you pass an airport newsstand, you'll see women's magazines and almost all of them. I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 90% of them have something on the cover to do with losing weight or changing mm-hmm. your body, right? But now, oh, it seems, now it seems like more of the men's uh, magazines are doing the same. So and we're seeing more men with eating disorders as well. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. And I'm, yeah, like, I mean, if you look at, and even not even just so much like a men's type of health magazine or fitness magazine, which you kind of expect it to be that way. But if mm-hmm. you look at any kind of athletic magazine or sports magazine, like everybody on there, it's all about, you know, you know, how did I lose weight to get, you know, to up my game and how did I, you know, drop all these pounds and this is my eating regimen to do this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. So it is, it, you know, it is, you're right, like so much of what you read today, even though you don't always necessarily think it is, there are, there are a lot of messages that are promoting changing yourself somehow to fit in or to be like somebody else. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. You can't just be yourself anymore. You have yep. to be someone else. <laughs> so let me ask you this for those people who are listening who may be at the beginning of their journey to healing from trauma and the eating disorders or trauma and other consequences what were some of the things that helped you in the beginning like how do you make how do you take that first step and what is that first step what was it for you the first step in terms of I think was really just realizing that I needed to take a first step Okay. Um, to, to acknowledge, and, and, and this goes for working with trauma or, you know, changing your outlook in the way that you um, look at food and, or anything. It's all about, you know, so often I spent time thinking I didn't really have a problem or I ignored the fact that I had a problem with food or that I had a self-esteem issue, that I was a trauma survivor. So I really had to, I had to take that hard look at myself and say, man, I'm really having some struggles with this, or I really don't relate to this well, or looking through my life, I don't, I don't see myself the way that others see me and just all this. So realizing that there's something you need to work on is -hmm. probably the biggest thing because, you know, we'd rather just stuff it down and pretend it doesn't exist. So that way we can- Or we blame the circumstances. So for you, for you, it was the continuing low self-esteem, you said. Mm -hmm. Uh, You had relationship issues. Mm -hmm. Um, Food, uh, relationship with food was not good. You were- gaining weight, losing weight, dieting, et cetera. So those were some of the clues. Were there other clues that like a therapist might immediately pick up on, but that you didn't pick up on besides those? Well, I mean, those were the main ones, but it was really when I was working with a therapist and a coach, it was really forcing, or they, they, would, they would see how much I would minimize myself um, minimize any potential good thing, play it down. Um, yeah. And then I would really, really embellish every struggle, every challenge, every negative thing I always did. Like I was always all about, I'm always screwing up. I'm, I'm always doing that. I never do this. So I'm living in this catastrophizing world inside mm-hmm. my own head. But yet whenever there was a compliment or something good about anything about me, whether it was me personally or something I did, I would minimize it and push it down. So I wasn't celebrating wins. I wasn't acknowledging myself for who I am, Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a person, as a colleague, as a friend, as a a father, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn to not only, you know, understand the the changes that I needed to make, but understand that, you know, I'm not such a bad person and that there are some good things about me and I can celebrate a win and be okay with that. And I can take a compliment now and then and not just push it to the side and, you know, try and find a reason why it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. So it sounds like you, you, you've been on a pretty strong recovery journey journey. Where are you now with uh, your trauma healing, your, your eating issues? Uh, 
Well, I mean, I've been at this thing for, you know, a while now. So I always like whenever I work with clients, it's all over my website and my blog and podcast. I always say that healing from trauma is a lifelong journey, but it doesn't mean that you are doomed to be a victim forever. It doesn't mean that you're going to struggle so, so heavily forever. It just means that. But I, th- I think it is important though, that people know that it's not an overnight. Yeah, it's not. You know, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, t- I mean you, it takes time working with a professional. It takes a lot of work on your own half, a lot of, you know, seeing yourself for who you really are. And um, it, it really, I would say, I am worlds ahead of where I was years ago. I mean, I mean, even like three, four years ago. So I know I've made tremendous progress in areas with food and with self-esteem and with acknowledging that I am a survivor and what the heck mm-hmm. that even is. Yeah. And so, but it, it is a lifelong thing, but it's not that you struggle and you're a victim forever, but you learn how to manage those feelings. You learn how that, you know, a flashback doesn't keep you stuck for Mm -hmm. days, weeks, months, you know, now all of a sudden I'm I'm able to bounce back and be a lot more resilient than I used to be. Well, I think that's important for people to hear that there's hope. Mm -hmm. And many people that I've worked with are afraid to even go there. You know, they're afraid to even deal with uh, childhood abuse or trauma or and yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's very scary. So what was it, your, just your unhappiness that drove you to really go there and get into it and say, I'm going to do this? Or what was it? What was it the It was hook? kind of this, it was this thing of, I've been going this way for the last 40 some years of my life. It's not working. Something's got to change. Like okay. I was, I was pretty much at the breaking point. You know, when I when I first sought out a therapist, like I said, it wasn't for trauma. It was because I thought I was broken with like you know being uh, in, in relationships. Yeah. And so while I did work on that, and I had a lot of things to do, but it you know it was just this point of how long you know how much longer do I need to keep repeating the same habits to realize they don't work, and then to start making some changes because you know I got into this rut of being comfortable and being in a familiar place. And so it's, it's easy to stay where you are when it's familiar, even if it's not healthy, it's familiar, it's safe, it's comforting. You know, it's, it's what I know. So I don't want to get out of my comfort zone and feel something I don't want to feel or deal with something I don't want to deal with. So you have to get to a point where you're like, I am sick and tired of being miserable. I'm sick yeah. and tired of having problems with food. I'm tired of looking at myself in the mirror and being ashamed. I'm tired of, you know, you know, having struggles going to the, or to the, to the store to buy clothes or whatever it is you're doing. It's really just getting to, the, to this breaking point of I need to make a change and, and, and I need to do it for me, not for my husband, my wife, my kids, my worker, co-workers, but I need to do this for me so I can feel better so I can go after the things that I want in life and not be ashamed of what, you know, I want to do and my dreams and my goals and the way I look. And if, you know, if I'm somebody who's thin, great. If I'm somebody who's larger, great. Like come to a point where you're sick and tired of comparing yourself and being miserable. Exactly. Okay. Well, I think your message is very inspiring. Your story is very inspiring. I love the fact that you're so open and honest about it. And I think people listening hopefully can hear that there's hope and that there's help and that you can change. You don't have to be miserable your whole life. Do you have any last minute uh, words for people who are listening who are trauma survivors? And tell us also how we can find out about your podcast, which I was a guest on earlier. Yes. This- <laughs> mm-hmm. yes. So tell yeah, us I mean, more about what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, just as kind of some parting words is, you know, from coming from somebody who, who suppressed everything for, you know, three decades and just pretending it didn't exist and it didn't affect me, you know, it does. And it's okay that, you know, we need help. It's okay to ask for help. It doesn't, especially if you're a guy, you know, as us guys, we're like, we got to toughen up. We got to play the man card. We got to push our feelings aside and take care of everybody else and not worry about it. So when you, you know, get to a point where you're okay with reaching out for help, when you're asking for somebody to give you some insight, to help point you in the right direction, to beginning to feel better, to acknowledge what's, what's happened, and, you know, to, to, and, you know, while we talk about radical acceptance, a lot of understanding that, you know, whatever happened in the past, you going about in the past, trying to worry about trying to change it, trying to figure out when rationalize why you did something is never going to work. You cannot yeah. change what happened, but you can change the way that you approach yourself in the future, the way that you deal with your struggles. And that, you know, there's no shame in asking for help. And one, one of the biggest hurdles is getting over that, getting past that shame 
and, and, and then taking that first step of just working through things a little bit at a time, baby steps all the way, nothing, you know, you can't go from being a survivor in victim mode to being a thriver overnight or even over weeks or months. It takes a long time, but it is so unbelievably worth it. So that would be my kind of parting uh, I, think, I think that's a very important message, especially to men, like you mm -hmm. say, who aren't coming forward because they're ashamed that they were abused. There's so yep. many. And yeah, there is. And yeah, I mean, I work with, with guys and groups and stuff where, you know, it, the shame and the having to suck it up and, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, you know, not be vulnerable is huge. So yeah. but taking that first step little by little, um, you know, reach out for help. There's resources out there. If you ever want to contact me, you can hit me up on beyondyourpast.com. That's the main coaching website. Uh, the, there's links to my podcast there, which is on iTunes and Mental Health News Radio Network and pretty much any, any podcasting app, you can just search for Beyond Your Past. Um, if you want to see my Survivor blog, which is what started the whole journey, that's at survivingmypast.net. So any of those places, just search for Surviving My Past or Beyond Your Past or Matthew Pappas and you'll find me. Okay, great. Matt, it's been so great to talk to you today. I really appreciate your sharing your story with everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carolyn. I appreciate it. It's been an honor to be on your show. Thank you.